we're going to be entering the post-silicon era. And there could be massive disruption. Who wants to buy a computer anymore, knowing it's the same as last year's model? Silicon Valley, the envy of nations around the world. Silicon Valley could become a rust belt. Think of that. Unemployment, devastation, people out of work in Silicon Valley. Why? Your Pentium chip today has a layer about 20 atoms across. The Pentium chip that you hold in your hand, 20 atoms across. In 10, 15 years, it's going to be five atoms across. At that point, quantum mechanics takes over. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle takes over. You don't know where the electron is anymore if your Pentium chip has a layer five atoms across. Leakage, heat, all these things destroy Moore's law. What we need is a replacement because this will determine the next Silicon Valley. I repeat, the next Silicon Valley will be determined by who can create a successor to silicon. The well, fact is that Aspect's experiment confirms quantum mechanics and it confirms it in this very peculiar situation. So that I'm obliged to admit that the quantum correlations exist in the world and if we are to explain them and not just accept them as given, if we are to explain them, we are obliged to invoke something like actions going faster than light from one place to another. It's as if somebody was playing a trick on us. It's as if behind the scenes Imagine, for example, that you have a, a railway system. We know that the trains cannot go faster than light, but you might, by studying the timetable very carefully, discover that during the night, trains have to be returned to their starting point faster than light. So behind the scenes, extraordinary things are happening which we cannot use personally. And this is a dilemma. I don't think we have a good way of looking at it. It's as if somebody was playing a trick on us. It's as if somebody was playing a trick on us. One of the areas that's of um, enormous interest and excitement today across physics and engineering uh, goes by a new name called quantum information science, or QIS. And that involves um, theoretical physicists and experimental physics, mathematicians, engineers of many stripes. And it's leading to uh, amazing breakthroughs in the laboratory. Things like uh, quantum encryption, early progress in quantum computers. There have even been real world demonstrations of quantum encryption where people have used this new technique to protect the transfer of information like money wires between a bank and city hall or uh, the circulation of electronic voting in, in, uh, in federal elections. And so this is an amazing new development that rests on some fundamental insights into the nature of quantum mechanics uh, that's about to be poised to be a sort of multi-billion dollar worldwide industry. So I've been curious, how do we get to a world in which sort of bankers and politicians turn to quantum physicists to protect their most valuable information? That seems like a, a weird and, and new kind of development. The origin of this field comes uh, certainly in part from a kind of, uh, from not, a, not as exciting a time in physics. In fact, from a kind of uh, years of, uh, of, of, of a kind of hardship in the field. Uh, from the early and mid-1970s, when physics was in the doldrums it, by many ways of trying to sort of characterize it. There had been an enormous growth in the field after World War II in the United States, in the Soviet Union, throughout Western Europe, and that had come crashing, tumbling down around 1970. So much so that in the United States, by the early 1970s, by 1972, there were more than a thousand young PhDs in physics looking for jobs and only 50 jobs to compete for. So a thousand to 50. It had just, the bottom had fallen out. It was a horrible time to be a young physicist in the United States. 
And so it turns out in the midst of that kind of enormous uh, dislocation, there was a group of very smart, very well-trained young physicists. They'd gotten their PhDs sort of at just the wrong moment. They were trained in some of the most elite programs across the United States. They had their PhDs. They published good jur journal articles. And they went looking for jobs just as the market was was the most horrible when, when so many people were going without jobs in the field for which they trained so hard. So these folks, there are about 10 of them all together. Through different kind of quirky accidents of history, they wound up bumbling along and they made their way to Berkeley, California, right near San Francisco. Most of them were either out of work or kind of underemployed. They were not getting the kinds of jobs they had anticipated with their fancy PhDs. Uh, but they also realized they shared amongst each other a passion, a real driving interest in the foundations of modern physics, in the kind of the, the philosophical um, basis for this emerging and very counterintuitive view of the world. And they had time on their hands. So they met together and they formed an informal, very playful discussion group. They called themselves the Fundamental Physics Group. They were just being playful. They met at Berkeley every Friday afternoon for about four years, week after week after week. And they decided if they might not be able to pursue a typical career in physics, they could at least try to drive, uh, try to go after their, their deep curiosity about the world. One of the topics really dominated their discussion, and that's called quantum entanglement, or it's often called Bell's theorem. It's named for an Irish physicist named John Bell. Uh, Bell had been fascinated also by the kind of deep questions at the heart of quantum mechanics, which were not uh, garnering a lot of attention in his day. This was a kind of side interest of his that he kept kind of quiet. And he'd published a, pa a paper, quite remarkable, elegant paper, in the mid-1960s, uh, which showed that if, if our current understanding of quantum theory is correct, that was an if, if our understanding of quantum theory is correct, then the world should be subject to this kind of very strange property, very strange behavior, where quantum particles, objects that had once interacted, could retain a kind of connection with each other, even if they were moved arbitrarily far apart. Earlier physicists had wondered if that was true. Einstein had hoped it wasn't true. He thought it was uh, horrible. Einstein called this spooky action at a distance. That was not meant to be um, polite. He thought it was just disgusting. Who would, who would think such a crazy thing? And it was Bell's great genius to show that, like it or not, quantum theory requires that to be true. That doesn't mean that's true of the world. It's true of quantum theory, inescapably. Uh, that there could be these kind of long distance connections across arbitrary distances. So if we do some action on a particle here, it should instantly affect what could be measured of this partner particle, even if that's on a different galaxy. Very counterintuitive. Well, that was exactly the kind of deep question about the structure of nature that this gaggle of very well-trained, creative, underemployed Berkeley physicists, that's what, they were, that's what they were after. So that topic of Bell's theorem, or entanglement, dominated their discussions week after week after week when they met uh, in the, throughout the mid-1970s. In fact, one founding member of the group, uh, John Clauser, had even performed the very first laboratory test of this strange idea. He and a student, uh, Stuart Friedman, had actually conducted a laboratory test to see, are the predictions of quantum mechanics really borne out? Does it matter if I make a measurement of this particle here? Does that affect the, the, the type of outcomes one would measure here uh, instantaneously, or at least faster than light could have traveled between? So they were uh, obsessed with this, or certainly enamored with this question of quantum entanglement. Well, it turns out they were doing all this work in the San Francisco area in the 1970s when San Francisco was going through an enormous kind of counterculture bloom where all kinds of nutty sounding ideas were, were more in the mainstream there than most other places. So the regular newspapers would routinely report on experiments in uh, mind reading, in ESP, in things like spoon bending, in occult stuff, in UFOs, in, in stuff that, that brings a smile to our faces to this day. And, and should. And so we have this group of people who are digging in to learn more and more about this preposterous sounding feature of quantum mechanics, this uh, attachment as if what I do here can somehow affect what happens here instantly. And some of them began to wonder, is that really so different than mind reading or ESP? Even further, might that be an actual explanation for some of these strange sounding phenomena? This was a time when mind reading experiments were in fact, as I say, um, certainly not um, uh, believed by everyone, but they were, they had a kind of local presence in the newspapers, in, in discussion groups and all that in San Francisco at the time. 
all out of proportion instead of before or since. So these folks began to wonder about quantum entanglement and its possible even weirder implications. Well, I mentioned these folks, by and large, did not have sort of regular jobs. Few of them were in universities. They weren't getting large grants from, from, uh, from the National Science Foundation, the way most physicists might support their work. And so what they were able to do was cobble together a kind of unusual support network. So one source of funding for at least some of these folks turned out to be the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. Uh, it turns out some analysts, some basically some spies in the US government, were worried at just that time that the Soviet Union was getting much better at mind reading than the US. We've seen examples of intelligence going awry time and time again. And so at the time, there was earnest, you know, classified briefings. The Soviets are advanced in mind reading. Maybe they're advanced in mind control. And this, of course, sets off all kinds of warning bells in the US government. And so that starts opening up funding for what we might call non-traditional research in areas like mind reading. So there was, as we now know, uh, years and years later, some of these reports were declassified. Millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars were spent by the federal government on mind reading experiments. And some of these sort of underemployed Berkeley physicists were hired as consultants. They would help work on some of those, try to explain some of those phenomena, using what they knew about these weird, quirky features of quantum mechanics. Another source of, of uh, support were the sort of um, California entrepreneurs of this kind of new age, hippie, counterculture spirit. Uh, people who, were, who worked on things like the human potential movement. Could these wacky new ideas about quantum theory, about how particles might share an attachment across time and space, could that help unlock human potential? Are, are humans capable of so much more than, than our conventional understandings would allow? So some of them became enamored of this new work, uh, very generous sponsors, and they too devoted money year after year to try to support this kind of strange or unusual group of, of uh, very smart and very quirky young physicists in, in California. They helped spread their word through unusual means. They didn't submit most of their work to the main journal like the Physical Review. The Physical Review had a kind of a ban, or at least a very high rejection rate for anything on the on the foundations of quantum mechanics, like Bell's theorem, let alone for stuff like ESP. So they were not publishing in the main physics journals, though they had before. They were certainly well trained. But instead, a lot of their work circulated in these kind of underground hippie networks. They were mimeographed and sent by post by you know, through the mail to this kind of mishmash of people that included Nobel laureates in physics, most of whom hadn't asked for these materials, but they would show up in their in their mailbox, to occult enthusiasts and military, you know, spooks and everyone in between. So they're getting the word out in a kind of curious way. And some of them also helped get the word out through writing uh, very, very successful popular books. They were successful because they sold millions of copies. Uh, and they were also successful. Some of them won big uh, book awards. These were considered well-written books uh, in their day. Books like The Tao of Physics by Fritz F. Copper, The Dancing Wuli Masters by Gary Zukov. These were, these were widely, widely uh, best-selling popular books that were written by members of this group or friends of the group and trying to get into print these kind of this cluster of new ideas about the real spookiness of quantum mechanics and maybe some of its further, further along uh, implications. And so what really fascinated me was when we, when we start digging into uh, how we get to a field like quantum information science today, we realized that these folks had cornered the market in thinking hard about Bell's theorem at a time when very few other physicists were. They really were thinking hard about quantum entanglement when that was still out of fashion. And even more important, they produced a series of thought experiments, increasingly clever, very ingenious thought experiments, because they really thought that Bell's theorem would be in conflict with Einstein's relativity. And that has big stakes. They thought, and they had good reason to think, even John Bell wondered, whether this spooky action at a distance, tickle a particle here and change th something over here instantaneously, that seems to violate relativity and, and causality, at least as physicists understood it. So it looked like the two pillars of modern physics were heading for collision. Would quantum theory actually be compatible with relativity? If not, that would be big news. So members of this Berkeley group, this fundamental physics group, began designing very clever thought experiments to force the issue, to try to find that weak joint in the architecture of modern physics. And through this sort of underground network, through these sort of mimeographs, things that show up in various people's mailboxes, they helped spread the word. 
And in fact, they helped instigate a number of other physicists to try to think about that very carefully. The stakes were very high. And so uh, by responding to some of these thought experiments from, from this Berkeley group, a number of other physicists around the world, some in Europe, some in various places in North America, wound up proving new features about quantum mechanics that no one had known before. Heisenberg hadn't known before, John Bell himself hadn't known before, the most famous of which today is called the no cloning theorem, a deep fundamental fact about quantum theory that no one had known. And it was discovered precisely by trying to, trying to unpack these clever provocations from this Berkeley group. Well, it turns out quantum entanglement and, the, and this follow-up called the no cloning theorem, those are the most important starting ingredients for things like quantum encryption. That's how we get encrypted quantum systems today. Uh, further along, uh, members of this group were writing kind of uh, the earliest pedagogical materials to get news about quantum entanglement into the physics classrooms because the textbooks hadn't caught up yet. So you take this whole package together, and it looks like this group uh, in Berkeley, they were wrong more often than they were right. All scientists are. We all make mistakes all the time. But often their mistakes were very productive mistakes. These were extremely well-trained and disciplined folks. They'd done all their problem sets who also were out of, out of uh, the ordinary routine. They were asking sort of freewheeling or unusual questions, and that combination led to some very creative and very unusual uh, uh, brainstorming from which eventually the entire community uh, could learn and benefit. So what we have at the end of the day of this kind of crazy uh, collision of different kinds of people and personalities and ideas is a bunch of, of mostly out of work hippies or pe some people who were deeply into the San Francisco hippie counterculture scene who also had been very well trained. They'd done their problem sets, they were well disciplined, they were open to a whole range of ideas, some of them frankly quite nutty sounding. So they combined sort of training uh, and a kind of way out there perspective that was quite different from the mainstream. And together, they were able to produce a string of what we might call productive mistakes. They were wrong. They were wrong more often than they were right, like all scientists. But some of the times when they were wrong, they were wrong in very productive ways. And that, and that bequeathed to the entire community a set of things that we all now know that none of us knew before. It's as if somebody was playing a trick on us. It's as if somebody was playing a trick on us.